Namaste and welcome to this a very important event in the lives of our young scholars because they are launching a major work they have put together for three years. Also a big event for Infinity Foundation because we've always said that we want to do pioneering work, research work as one part of our, uh, our, our mission. The second part is to train and mentor the next generation of scholars, which is what we are doing today. And the third is to build a lasting institution. So this is a, an important contribution that we are making, not only in the content, content that it is, is in the book, but also the fact that we're training and mentoring young scholars who will have an amazing career, I'm pretty sure. So, and congratulations to Divya and her team. And um, congratulations to Sankrant for publishing this book and to all, all others. I also want to thank uh, our wonderful editor who is here. And, and so many, so many people, they're all, we have a long day, so we'll be naming people, mentioning people throughout the day. Uh, and, and Sanjana, of course, is a, a, an invaluable part of the thought process and not just editor, but also making sure that the publisher does the right job and every, all of us do the right job. Uh, the idea of this book was hatched several years ago, just before COVID. We had our annual retreat in Rishikesh around the time of the Shara. So, you know, we like to put out a promotional video every year around the holiday season. So, this, that particular year, I worked with the cartoonist and uh, suggested that because the Shara, there are 10 heads of Ravan. So, I said, well, if we want to bring it in the context of today, who would be the Ravan personas, the 10 personas of Ravan. It's a metaphor for the 10 heads, is 10 personas. And we came up with these 10 people uh, who kind of uh, epitomize the, uh, you know, the anti-Hindu kind of uh, sentiment in the academic world. And so we did a cartoon where uh, we had this uh, Ravana in the center, and then we had 10 of their heads, actually heads showing. And then each head in the animation would come up and start speaking some nonsensical stuff about, against Hinduism. And then the next one would come up and speak. And we had it in, the, in, the, in, it was pretty exciting. It was just two minutes of this. And the thing went viral. So when we met for our retreat, this was fresh in our minds. And the discussion was that, hey, you know, why don't we turn this into a book? And each of you can pick one personality of the modern Ravan. So the rules were very clear. Uh, no one is allowed to insult any of them. There is no hitting below the belt. There is no personal attacks, no ad hominem attacks. Uh, you cannot uh, abuse or be slanderous or any of that. You have to focus on the work of that person, not their li personal life or, person or their private life or personality. It's their intellectual life. And um, uh, so the fir first step for a writer one of our, any of our writers was to take that individual they're critiquing and get a large amount of their written work, read it, read it properly, mark what you think you need to, you want to criticize and quote it accurately. You, you cannot insinuate, you have to quote it accurately and then give your counter arguments and then give evidence for your counter arguments. So when these things were done uh, and with Divya in charge of managing the whole project, then the uh, we encouraged people to review each other's. So they reviewed each other, gave feedback, and then we sent it out for external reviews. I did a level of reviewing also. And so this, these articles are solid. Uh, they are the result of a lot of hard work. And uh, uh, then, of course, it went to our external editor to do one final or multiple rounds of editing. So it's gone through a lot of quality controls. Uh, namaste, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My regards to all uh, the panelists as well present over here. I will be speaking in the present session on the work by Irfan Habib, 
who is one of our country's most leading Marxist uh, historians. So in this uh, particular essay in the book, you will uh, see me focus on four major themes from Habib's work and critiquing them. Irfan Habib is very important. He has authored several uh, works, including uh, from the People's History of India series, which was funded by the Indian Council of Historical Research. He has also worked on the Indus Valley Civilization. He has worked on the National Movement, which is studies in ideology and history. He has also worked on the Atlas of Ancient History and several such important works. Mirroring the structure in my paper, which is there in the book, what I will be doing in my talk as well is to focus on Habib's work on the Indus Valley Civilization, then his role in turning major national institutes into fiefdoms, his role as the witness number 70 for the Sunni Waqf board at the Ayodhya Ram Janmabhoomi uh, case, several of his words which have shown historical revisionism, and then I will summarize all of these in my conclusions. So one of Irfan Habib's major works as an eminent historian is on the Indus Valley Civilization. He has also authored a monograph on this. Since historical materialism is one of the core elements of Marxist historiography, where relationships between the society which is seen through various classes, and its means of material production. This relationship is studied to understand economic and social aspects of the system. Even in Habib's words, we will see conclusions which have been drawn from this lens. So on the IVC in particular, Habib's work uses the chronological template which has been drawn from uh, Gregory Purcell's uh, the Indus Age. He dates the Indus Valley Civilization to 1500 BC, and in his own words, he does so by linking it with the beads that have been found in Mesopotamia. Now, why is this important particularly, especially for a, a monograph which has been authored in 2002? Even by this time, we have had research on you know, the IVC sites from Dholavira, Rakhigar, Lothal, and so on, and the remarkable excavations which we have unearthed had already challenged Habib's words. But you will not find any of this acknowledged in his work, but the primary basis is the template that he can arrive by comparing it with beads in Mesopotamia. Now, why is this important? This is important because one of the main standards that we have noticed in the words of several historians uh, which have focused on this is the primacy accorded to the data of inequality from outside India as against focusing on that within India. In one of my other papers as well, I will come to it. Um, we will see that, for instance, sources from Indian traditional canon Right? whether it is our own regional, whether it is our own sources from Sanskritam, for instance, they will be accorded a lower primacy versus comparing to what the chronology and other elements can be inferred to from, let's say, great sources. So that is one of the hallmarks that you will see in many of these historians' works. On the other hand, in, uh, in this particular uh, work, you will see Habib making references based on just pure hypotheses, not based on any evidence, saying that there could be factors of ideology and superstition which were, which were uh, uh, associated with the Indus Valley Civilization age. He says towns could have been centers of religious cults and pilgrimages, and godkins could have been associated with priesthoods. Uh, there could have been all the uh, marks and symbols that are found, which could have led to writing. Now, why is this important again? For many, for many decades, one of the primary themes that has followed in most historians' words is that Indian civilization is predominantly an oral culture and writing is perhaps something which was imported into India. There are many sources even within the Indian traditional canon which can challenge this. And there are words including by um, one by Maid Kalyanasundaram which have actually challenged this, but no. 
they do always come back to comparing writing as something which was perhaps imported into India due to its geographical proximity with, let us say, Iran or any other Helmand civilizations. Another important factor to remember when any of these comparisons are being made is the arrow of direction. Two Marxist historians and most other uh, colonial and post-colonial historians, the arrow of direction is always from outside India into India. That is, they want to show writing is something which came from outside India into India. Perhaps even Sanskritam is something which came outside India into India. At the same time, there is nothing in their writing which, uh, which counts for evidence to show why it cannot be even any other way. So what one, have, one realizes through this is that the burden of proof falls on the Indian scholars to disprove this error. And it's not one asking, OK, why can't it be the other way around to begin with? On uh, the, the famous uh, uh, priest king artifact, which has, is now you know, synonymous with the Indus Valley civilization um, excavations, Habib maintains that this is not a priest king or a yogi associated with Indian uh, culture, what we, what we traditionally believe, but it is something which is associated with Sumerian civilization. He also maintains that while the Indus civilization cannot be admired for any great art, this priest king statue, which, is, which was unearthed at Mohenjo-daro, must have connections to Mesopotamia, right? So he, he believes this in contrast to many other scholars who traditionally believe that this association is one of that of a yogi, right? That is what is associated. The Pashupati seal as well, which is again, um, becomes synonymous with the entire Mohenjo-daro excavations. If you look at that, if you look at the bull deity, which is there, traditionally it is associated with the image of a Shiva, right? Because Shiva is uh, found in the Rig Veda and so on. But Habib again believes this to be associated with um, any other outside representations. Habib's work also on IVC, it follows the thread even in 2002. This is a monograph written in 2002. It still follows the thread of colonial archaeologists such as uh, Stuart Pigott and Mortimer Wheeler, who used Aryan invasion theory as the template when they came to their conclusions in colonial times. On the other hand, we have these other mother goddesses clay figurines which have been excavated as well in the Indus Valley civilizations. But even here, which shows that you know there must have been perhaps a matrilinear uh, system pre uh, prevalent during the time, Habib has instead managed to find discrimination, which you can truly trust a Marxist historian to find anywhere. He believes that some of the um, the women there must, the women during the time must have subject to hard physical labor, and hence even the unearthing of system of figurines such as the mother goddess ones do not point to a matrilineal system, but instead it shows the hardships perhaps that women had to go through. So he finds such convoluted threads to focus on in the Indus Valley Civilization uh, series. This is another important uh, thread. The relationship between the Indus Valley Civilization and the Rigvedic people has been a phenomenal work which has been done by historians such as Bibi Lal and many other, um, you know, from the Archaeological Survey of India and other historians. But Habib believes that the dancing deity, right, the dancing girl, figurine, which was again unearthed from the Indus Valley Civilization, he does not see you know, any associations associated with India for that but he sees this to be associated with any uh, Sumerian civilization. He also believes that the IVC were primarily zoomorphic, whereas the Rigvedic were anthropomorphic. This kind of a distinction is again trademarked colonial scholarship. It is not one of uh, post-colonial independent Indian scholarship. So this is also a characteristic from Habib's work. Habib also dismisses the evidence of the fire altars, which have been found at the IVC sites, such as in Kalibangan and uh, Lothal. And he disconnects it from any association with the Rigvedic rituals. Instead, he attributes it to some local phenomena of uh, you know, fire cults, apparently, which may have been during the time. He also dismisses uh, any associations between any, any challenge which emerges, for instance. Um, 
let me give a, a brief background to this. If one were to go by one of the characteristic uh, Aryan invasion or slash migration theory features, which is to believe that a group of people came from outside, the natural questions that arise include, OK, let's say they have moved in. Why is it that there is no remnant of this migration or invasion in any of our texts? It can't have been that you know you had a massive migration and collective uh, memory loss. There should have been some, some remnants left behind. These could have even been in, for instance, in the names of the rivers, right? The, the local area in which you have settled, the names of the rivers. At least they should have some character, uh, characteristic traits. Whereas Habib dismisses all of that to say that even if the language names have not changed and the river names have, have continuous history from the Sindhu Saraswati civilization to what we follow today, he does not even consider this and hence this is an anomaly. So, so any challenge that you have to, to the traditional IVC questions, they are pushed down with these kind of answers. Habib also dates the Rigveda to 1500 BC. Now, what is the basis for uh, his template? It is not anything from the Samskritam literature or any of those, but it's again the pre-colonial the colonial scholarship. He uses the Avesha to date the Rigveda. And even in 2002 and post-2002, when you've had evidence from, let's say, archaeological, geological, geohydrological material, which has been unearthed for the Saraswati River civilization, none of these, um, none of these evidences feature in Habib's work. And in fact, all of these have challenged the 1500 BC dating, which Habib uses. There is, of course, the cherry picking of data, which is another feature that you see throughout his work. He has omitted any research which is there with the Saraswati River Paleo channels, for instance. I would refer to this paper where we have summarized all the work on this. And 1500 BC, dating the Rigveda to that, is not possible when 1900 BC itself can be the terminus antiquum for the Mahabharata. There is another paper to which I would refer one. In this, we show that. Uh, an analysis of, you know, the terms Arya and Dravida from uh, the traditional Sanskrit literature. Then we also consider the term Saraswati in the Mahabharata. We have analyzed all the utterances of this term and studied for their nature. This plus all even in, you know, this particular decade, if we consider the um, geological uh, evidences which have come up, all of them put 1900 as the terminus antiquum. What is terminus antiquum? That is, it cannot be later than that. So if that is the datum that we can give to the Mahabharata, then giving 1500 to Ridveda would not make sense. Again, I quote directly from his work over here, where he says, um, where he comes up with uh, contrived explanations for some of the remains that have been found at Mohenjo-daro. And he says that these could have been victims of violence from invaders or marauders when actually there has been no such evidence found at all. Now, the question comes down to why are all of these important? Why is it important to study some of these inferences on IVC and so on from Habib's work? At the heart of all of this understanding lies for us to know what is at stake. And what is at stake for us is some of our assets. What are our assets? It is the Vedas and it is the earliest form of Samskritam. If one were to go with the chronology presented by these historians, colonial and post, some of the post-colonial historians, then the indigeneity of the Vedas, the indigeneity of the earliest form of Samskritam will be called into question. The, or these also lead to other kinds of narratives where our identity is dislocated. The origin of Samskritam to this geographical, larger geographical location is questioned and dislocated. Then it also has weakly substantiated and forced parity between the so-called migrating Aryans and any other invaders who may have come later on. So that is where it is very important for us to recognize what is it at stake through each of these arguments that come through the words of such historians. I will now turn to the second uh, section of my presentation, which is uh, Habib's role in turning na national institutions into fiefdoms. So Habib is a nominated member of the Indian Council of Historical Research. He, he's been its chairman for two terms. Now, the primary uh, aim of this ICHR, which is a tax-funded organization, 
is to promote and give directions to historical research and encourage and foster objective and scientific writing of history. It's, among its objectives also includes to inculcate an informed appreciation of the country's national and cultural heritage. Now, given this role, uh, Habib was on the advisory committee for the journal as well, and this was disbanded in 2015. Arun Shauri, in his eminent historians, very readable book, has shown the kind of work which has happened at ICHR for the past several decades. Among Habib's uh, roles include writing the foreword to the plagiarized work, which uh, was submitted by uh, Tasneem Ahmed. The committee which was constituted to check this found complete plagiarism between his work as well as that written by uh, Dr. Parmatma Sharan. ICHR's uh, Towards Freedom Project is another uh, milestone moment in which Habib was supposed to author a book. Now, this project series has been running since 1972. That is, as, it is as old as ICHR itself. As of 2015, 42 lakhs had been spent on a single volume uh, of the ICHR, and yet there was nothing. Apparently, in, uh, by, in uh, 2015, I think this is 2015, there was yet to even a single volume to come out. I think Shauri again hits the nail on the head when he says the real crime of these eminences does not lie in the loss they have inflicted in terms of money, but the condition to which they have reduced these institutions. Uh, in the next section, I look at uh, Habib's role as witness number 70 for the Sunni Waqf board, in the Ram Janmabhoomi movement. I think the entire work can be summarized, suppress your very suggest your falsely. Suppress the truth and suggest what is false. So Habib has been among the advisor and even appeared as witness number 70 for the Sunni Waqf board, while he himself calling for objectivity and neutrality by so-called experts who were presenting evidence in the case which was going on. So the high CHR's historians have leveraged their institutional position in clout and even have passed resolutions regarding the Babri Masjid's demolition at international platforms such as the World Archaeology Conference which was held in Croatia. The Aligarh Historian Society under Habib's presidentship even refused to accept the ASI findings. They have also, by the way, questioned the Supreme Court judgment which has come out. Now, through all of this, the important thing which comes is some of the details. For instance, Habib comments that the Babri Masjid is believed to have been older than the Skanda Purana. But the Skanda Purana itself was composed at least in the 8th century CE. This is the most conservative latest date. We also have Habib's uh, role, the notorious role in the uh, Treta Ka Thakur inscription. I think uh, Dr. Meenachi Jain has done an excellent job documenting this in her book, The Battle for Rama. So Habib has, Habib vociferously claimed an inscription was stolen from the Lucknow Museum and placed at Ayodhya in 1992, when the Babri Masjid was demolished. And he kept, he went to the town with this until it was shown that the inscription that he's talking about is very different from the Vishnu Hari inscription, which was actually recovered from the demolished site at Ayodhya. He, uh, despite proving this, he has not withdrawn his claims. I think these, these are the two, uh, distinct inscriptions. I will now move to the uh, next section. So uh, if one were to look through Habib's work, they will, you will also find what is known as the co-opting of the freedom movement. This is, this is a project of the Marxist historians where they want to move past the role played by the communists during the freedom movement, where they in fact collaborated with the, with the British Empire. And instead, they want to see how they can be shown as a part of the freedom struggle movement. They want to establish this connection so that it's a template which can be repeated for any other marginalized groups. Habib now backtracks and says that, you know, the partial and uh, the ethno and there's a need to revisit the abuses that the communists had then hurled at, at the leaders like Gandhi, revisit the Marxist assessment of the national freedom movement. But this, revis this revisionism which, which he's uh, doing would not, ad would not hold for other groups, for instance. 
Uh, for all of these quotes, since we're short on time, I would request you all to you know, go to the book. Um, he uses the airbrushed role of the left in the freedom struggle to es explain how nationalism in India can be more relaxed, more rigid. Now, while Habib outlines this for the freedom movement, he says that other organizations, for instance, RSS, need to be excised and kept away from this whole revisionism. So um, to keep it short and so that we can move on to discussions, I will summarize my uh, points. So there is Habib's role in turning national tax-funded institutions into personal fiefdoms. There is his continuous denial of material evidence of the temple that was unearthed under the mosque and claiming that the Treta Thakur and Vishnu Hari inscriptions are the same. Habib's work on IVC continues to peddle discredited Aryan invasion and migration theories, and that needs to be, uh, that needs to stop being mainstream. And uh, for all other details, I would request you to read the book. Thank you. First of all, let me congratulate the young scholar. Because there are few in this country, not even five, who will stand up to challenge one of these Ravnas from Aligarh. And why I'm saying this, I have the experience with him in theory, in practice, virtual fights, seminars. And I, I won't mind saying I am the only privileged one in this country from whose hands he snatched a mic in a seminar. I think the next being now Arif Sahab, when he fought with him in Trivindram in a seminar. And I have always confessed this. I have spent 21 years as a comrade. But I never compromised on nationalism at that time. And that was always where these kajals used to start with these people. Okay, when it came to the country, when it came to India, the kajals will start. Besides these aspects which you have dealt with, I like you whenever you do the reason of this. You see, many of these things they are in open. But don't forget their operative aspects. How they operate. And I'll give you some examples of that. One thing which is not coming out, incidentally, I was main member secretary of ICH, uh, ICHR. I remained there for six months only because the government changed in 2004 and I was the first head to fall, fall at that time. One of the biggest scandals which I caught there was that all these books by Romila Thapa, R.S. Sharma, D.N. Ja, etc., etc., a long line of these books, lakhs and lakhs rupees were paid to these authors as advance royalty for having their translations in all Indian languages. And except for some books in Hindi, no books were ever published in any other languages. And when I made a move that these recoveries should be made, it was hue and cry at that time. There are other projects, I'll tell you. Uh, this Freedom Struggle Project, lying and lying, lakhs and lakhs of uh, rupees spent. Well, I asked Bipin Chandra, he was alive at that time, why don't you complete it out? No, we have lost the papers, everything, all excuses. Then, very interesting operative parts are, it starts with 71, you see, when the CPI took a very cautious decision to capture the academia in this country. With Nurul Hassan, left all these, every universities, every place, every appointment, and a click will sit. When I joined academics in 76, I called it an academic mafia. And I said that within these boxes, there were caste Marxists and there were regional Marxists and the Delhi University History Department was the best example from that. That if you were from Bihar, if you were from CPI, if you belong to a particular caste, a job was waiting for you in Delhi University History Colleges. Some of it continues even now also, even today. Then, 
एम यू इवन टूडे दे शाउट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बिग हल्ला एवरी डे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इज बींग टॉर्न कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इज बींग डिस्ट्रॉयड एंड ऑल दैट एंड वेन आई आस्क दम ए क्वेश्चन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर द ग्रेट रावना you believe in the constitution i said i believe in the yes i believe in the constitution i said then when you are in such a powerful position in amu with 125 of your relatives working in the university why don't you implement the constitution there what have we not implemented i said where is the reservation for sc sst in aligarh muslim university that's the only central university funded by the government of india where there is no reservation either in admissions or in job positions in this country and i am ashamed that our ministry still gives them grants gives milk to these snakes as rajiv ji has pointed out and everyone is shy to raise this question that why constitution is not followed in amu in these respects what then their operative styles i was lucky once a member to go for a ugc team to amu in the department because it's an advanced center of research in the country highest paid by the government so when we went there the report was ready we were treated well seen the report so what do you mean the two other very senior historians with me professor bibi lal And Professor S. N. Sena, I said nothing doing. We will have an open session in which you present your last five years. Then we will have question answers. Then we will give time to every individual teacher in the university to come and meet us, and if he personally wants to say something, then we will have a group session with PhD scholars and a group session with MS students. Let them openly say, and after that. you make your proposals for the future and then we'll discuss it out and this was taken as what is this happening ye irfan sahab ke raj mein kya ho raha hai ye to dictator the jo chahte the wo ho jaye but i was happy that the youngsters felt well because first time they were being involved in such an exercise in the department and when the final things happened i'll give you only one example i made a query i said you are a national advanced research center for medieval history yes yes we are a national research center so i said why is it that your whole research is confined only to the sultanate period and the mughal period the mughals never ruled all over india the sultanate never ruled all over india so where is the medieval south where is the medieval northeast india where is the medieval western india were the ahoms not there was tripura or any other part or any of the tribal parts didn't have any medieval in history so shirin musvi gets up ye to aap rss ka agenda laga rahe hain ka asking an academic question to you that why you have failed to talk of medieval history of that period is an rss agenda because everything for them this is the nicest excuse if they if they can't answer anything then everything is rss agenda in one of the seminars he made a statement persian is a must to write the history of medieval india so i got up i said this is coming from a marxist scholar you are talking that the official court language is a must to write the history of that period what about the oral tradition what about the indian languages we have ample records in mudi in rajasthan we have records of in south down south in different languages of the different parts and all no persian is a must i said sir then i have a question for you no i said comrade i have a question for you not sir yes i said do you know sanskrit no do you know pali no do you know kharoshti why should i know i said why then why you become an expert on ancient india and write on indus and write on vedic age and write on the homeland of aryans and all that and the youngsters clapped at this then i started thinking on many things why this is happening 
and I went to the writings of Marx. So when Marx is writing in 1853 that India has no history, its history is only that of invasions. And the question is, who will rule over India? Will the Turk rule over India? Will a, a Iranian rule over India? Or will the British rule over India? So it is the task of the British now, that white man's burden now to, you know, civilize India. That's what Marx is saying. And then saying that, you know, Indians are such fools that being humans, they worship even cow and they worship even, uh, you know, monkeys. So these, these, in fact, Marxist historians went beyond colonial historians to debunk Hinduism or to debunk whatever ancient India we had or everything we had. So no history of India, only history. And it is not, it doesn't start with Irfan. It starts with his father. Let's go into that deep, you know. Pick up the comprehensive history of India of the Sultanate period. Habib and Nizami. They talk of this Malik Gafur, his invasion to Somnath. And what they write, they, they are quoting Barani, but what they write in that, the aim of this, please just, the aim of this was not religious, it was just to loot the wealth over there. And the Ranis of the Raval Raja were given a decent treatment. And what Barani is writing, he is saying, the idol was broken. And not only broken, it was sent in a cart to Delhi. And both the Ranis of the Raval Raja were brought to Delhi, converted. One, Alauddin marries himself, puts in his haram, and the second forcibly married to his son and put his haram. But these people, and now, since time is not there, there's much more I can tell you them on these. But please have a look at this toolkit of Niladri Bhattacharya. It's available now. It's published in Cambridge papers. That why, how and for what purpose they want to not only manipulate, not only but distort, not even distort. They want to, history is a subject I have never used in my writings. Might have been the case, could be the case. This can be. No, history is facts. Reject effect or accept effect. You can't say that Ramayana and Mahabharata, you put them in the sources of Indian history. And then you selectively quote out of that the Chopai which suits you. Parantya Dikari. That is the only Chopai in Ramayana which explains the Ramayana society, nothing else. But luckily, and I was happy at the time that I also have the privilege of being the only member of the Indian History Executive Council who stood independently against them and defeated Shirin Musfi in an election in 1993 in Mysore. And that's the day till now. I am treated as enemy one. In all respects, they call me cop. Whatever names they can give, they give it to me. But I am not afraid. And I am very happy that you have carried the fight. A new awakening is coming among the Indian youth. This is very important. And if you permit, one line I want to say. Because no, that is a very important thing, you know. Because in modern India, I sorry, I didn't say. Bose was a fascist. He was with Hitler. I said, what the hell were you doing? Because you have talked of his 42 and all. You were supporting that Churchill, who by man-made famine, killed 10 lakh people in Bengal and Urisa. Germany and Japan had not done any harm to India. They had not exploited India. They had only, on the, on the contrary, they had supported the Indian revolutionaries every time in the boat. And Bose is amply clear, he's saying that I'm not bothered about it. And for 75 years, they hid an agreement, which I published in my book, that before Bose, INA forces moved towards Burma front, an agreement was done with the Japanese that all areas that will be liberated, no Japanese flag will fly there. Only the Indian tricolor will be there. And those areas will not be administered by the Japanese, but they will be administered by the Azad Hind Taj and Azad Hind Taj. But Bose is a fascist, but you spy on people. There are files and files I have discovered in the archives. Arrest him, arrest him, arrest him in 42. That's what they are doing. 
taking money from the government for the, for, to bring out their publications. And what do they do even today? They talk of Marxism. I think even Marx will go mad on seeing them that when they support China, a country which is today the biggest money lender in the world, the biggest land usurper in the world, a country where the labor has no rights, where people have no human rights, and that is the my God of the Indian communists and Irfan Habib even today. Thank you.